Hello my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. So guys, there's something really fishy with the Vatican. There really is. It's fishy. Um, you know, you got to look at the symbolism that we see everywhere. And I got something to show you at the end of this video that's, uh, if it's not photoshopped, then it's mind-blowing. And uh, what the hell is it? I don't know but that might be a good terminology what the hell is it <laughs> when you get down to it but let me show you this first um so obviously the symbology is there look at the pope's hat I, i've talked about this in probably 50 to 100 videos it's it's symbolic of the hat of dagon which is also so well there's also oans as well it's the same sort of fish god being and you know here you know the pope has his magic wand going right here there's a little pine cone there as well the symbology of the vatican it goes back to our babylonian sumerian roots out of which all these traditions all the abrahamic traditions really come out of and so here you see a priest of the fish god dagon right here and you know he looks like he's wearing a skinned fish on his back and there's the fish mouth miter. You got the Pope's hat. It's just, it's so clear that this is a continuation of a tradition that, you know, is is very old. And, you know, we're going to cover that as well. It, clearly, this is what they are referencing is, is Dagon, the fish god. And you see so clearly the symbology. And there's a woodcut relief down in the corner. Again, Dagon. Now, where did I see that symbol before? Where where did I see that? Oh, yeah. You know, it's like nothing is really new here. This is a continuation of something much, much older. Here you see Dagon in Mesopotamian sculpture. And, of course, we have the winged disc up here. Uh, the Anunnaki winged disc as well. And you see one being with wings and one being with the fish on it. And again, you know, it doesn't perhaps necessarily mean that Dagon himself was a merman, <laughs> you know, or a fish that was part fish, part human. Not necessarily, perhaps, you know, had the technology and perhaps, you know, drove his boat ashore. Hallelujah. And, you know, and the same thing with the wings. Doesn't mean they had wings growing out of their back. Perhaps they had the technology to fly. And so when we look at Dagon, or Dagon, I should say, Philistine, fertility god, and the symbol is fish or grain. His wife was Nanshi. And, th you know, this was a community of Canaanites. Okay, so when the Israelites came out of Egypt and they went into Canaan, Canaanites were worshiping Dagon. Uh, up around the 12th century BC. So timing is right there. And you see uh, he was a fertility deity that eventually morphed into an important Semitic god. And at one point it was actually the third god of a pantheon along with El. El, El is a name for God. And again, if we look at the biblical texts, there's the Yahwist text, the Eloist, which comes from El, which El was the chief Canaanite god, and then Baal. And Baal, you know, actually means Lord when you get down to it. So interesting stuff, you know, it, really interesting stuff that we see. All these connects, connections here and the Ichthys, the fish symbol which really comes from that earlier uh, tradition. Now, you know, who is this? Uh, this is Asherah. What's interesting about Asherah is she's the wife of Yahweh. And, you know, this has been tried to be cover covered up. Uh, but when we go back far enough, we see this. And so they try to say, they try to make Asherah interpret as tree. So, you know, you see the inscription on this one is, I blessed you by Yahweh and his Asherah. Now, does that make sense to say, I bless you by Yahweh and his tree? Or Yahweh and his wife, the goddess Asherah. So, very interesting. And again, he was kind of a storm god as well. It's so interesting when we get down deep to see. And Easter is the same god, same naming god, 
as Ashtaroth. And Ashtaroth, which really we could also equate to uh, Ishtar, it's basically Easter, is what it does translate to. So, you know, the the pagan traditions, quote-unquote pagan traditions, you know, they morphed. And, uh, you know, they were just basically made comfortable for a new set of believers in so many ways. And again, this doesn't mean uh, that Christ didn't exist. It doesn't mean that there isn't a God. You know, as, as I've shared with you, I do think that there is a creative force. You can't look at the universe and see uh, just how well it is put together. It doesn't come together by chance, not at all. And so uh, Oans was another god in the Mesopotamian mythology, an amphibious god who taught mankind wisdom. Described by Babylonian priest Barosus, he had the form of a fish with the head of a man under his under fish head and under fish tail the feet of a man. In the daytime, he came up to the seashore of the Persian Gulf and instructed mankind in writing the arts and the sciences. Oans was probably the emissary of Ea, who is also known as Enki, the god of fresh water deep and wisdom. Interesting, too, because Enki is also you know, referred to as the serpent. And so this is out of Encyclopedia Britannica. Interesting stuff. Very, very interesting stuff. Do you think possibly it could be that this was actually a man? Perhaps a, a survivor of Atlantis or Lemuria, something along those lines, or part of a group of just regular old men uh, that had technology way more advanced than the people on the surface. And so he would come out and teach people. Now we, we look into the book of Enoch and you know, there's some things in there that are very conflictory when you start looking at it. Same thing with the Bible, you know, because like in, Bi in the Bible in Genesis 6, it talks about the mighty men of old, the mighty men of renown. And then the next thing, it just skips right to and mighty men of old, like as in heroes, good guys, men of renown, you know, good guys again, uh, mythological beings like maybe Hercules or Samson or something along those lines. So you have that. And then the next sentence, they're talking about the giants that are eating everybody. And so, you know, God has to take care of them with the flood. Uh, interesting. And then we look in the book of Enoch. Again, we, we hear about these, quote unquote, fallen angels. And again, angel means a messenger. And, uh, you know, they taught mankind all sorts of secrets, writing, how to farm, uh, they taught women how to do makeup, and because of that, then it switches over to, like, grievous sins and death and destruction again. So, you know, it's it's kind of interesting because they're teaching us a lot of things that could uh, civilize us and give us culture, and then they're made out to be evil again. So it, it's just curious. Recognize that history is written by the victors. And so, you know, obviously we can't trust everything, but we could try to put pieces together at the same time. And so, you know, Oans again, and it relates to Ea again. So it's kind of interesting to see all this symbolism. And symbolism is rampant in the Vatican. And as we said, something very fishy going on there with this symbology and, you know, even more than fishy. Yeah, as we see now, the pine cone is everywhere, and the pine cone is also all throughout the Far East as well. And it's symbolic of the pineal gland. It's symbolic of the third eye, which, which is the all-seeing eye of Horus, because the all-seeing eye is the one that is the pineal gland, which actually has rods and cones like an eye, and when it's activated, we become more multidimensional more multidimensional in our capabilities, able to see into other realities and perhaps able to see things for what they really are, even if they are being portrayed as something else. So, so much symbology there. There's a lot of Egyptian symbology over the Vatican as well. As we see these Assyrian deities with pine cones in their hand, see the staff of Osiris, the Kundalini leads up to the pine cone, the pineal gland, when the kundalini is turned on, this is, this is referencing the Ida and the Pingala, the two currents that run straight up. Well, they don't run straight up. They intertwine around the spine. They cross at chakra points, 
This is the Shashumna, which is the central channel, which the Kundalini rises when the energy between the masculine and the feminine is balanced. As we know in Western civilization, it's a very imbalanced religion. There's no mention of the divine feminine, and that's, that's because they don't want to, us to have balanced energies. They don't want us to develop both sides of the brain, the left and right hemisphere. If we do that, if we learn the meditative techniques, then we could activate our kundalini. And then they're not the only ones that have activated pine cones. We do as well. We could see through their BS and we could see the truth. And you see the staff of Dionysus, the staff of Bacchus. This is all very, very well known, very clear. And then we have these uh, really grotesque sculpture here of Christ uh, that I don't think does him justice at all. It's a, a horribly creepy one. And when we look at, you know, this sculpture as, as a whole, it, it, God, that feels like uh, it doesn't feel heavenly at all. It feels quite the opposite. And yet here's the popes and the cardinals over there with their uh, Swedish guard right there, right? No, Swiss. I'm Swiss. Yes. <laughs> no offense out there. I just love those outfits, don't you? Um, interesting. Is it not with this twisted, kind of scary demonic? That's not how, you know, we would want to envision Christ coming back. That looks pretty damn creepy. What is up with that? You know, if I was them, I'd demand my money back from the artist. I would. I would say, uh, no, we don't want that. Okay, so this is the what the bleep files. And I got here from Kinnigan. Uh Kinnigan, his channel was just shut down on him, and this is Kinnigan 2.0. Uh, so, you know, he uh, covers things that a lot of people think are crazy, uh, such as the possibility that there are non-human beings really running the show behind the behind the scenes so here we see this procession of cardinals walking on through right uh probably off to do a solemn sacred ritual i'll leave that up to you guys as to what they're going to be doing back there um but what's interesting is when we look at this procession this being here <laughs> this being here well, it, it, it's, it's unusual. Let's just say that. So when we look at this being closely, where's a Ted? Wait a minute. It's short. It's got this odd black head here. It's, it's, for one, it's way shorter. If these guys are all, you know, Five, eight to six feet tall for, on average. This is quite a bit shorter. And when you look at this thing, and, you know, this is a whole other thing too. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't ascribe to the whole blood sacrifice idea or the thought of eating the body of Christ and drinking the blood of Christ. That to me sounds awful like ritual, ritualistic sacrifice. And, you know, I just, I, I don't believe in that aspect of it. So look at this being closely. Uh, what is this thing? What is this thing? Well, you know, Kinnigan thinks it's a shape-shifting reptilian. That's, that's what he thinks. Uh, some people, if you read the comments below, think it's an alien extraterrestrial uh it walks weird and it looks weird it, it is weird i mean there's no way around it this thing is weird and i do have um i didn't get p permission to play these so i won't play them but i'll give you guys the link so you could play them but i did blow some up and whatever this thing is I don't know. Is that somebody like hooded? Is this a, a female that's completely hooded and wearing some sort of covering over her head? I don't know. What's your feel energetically? What do you think this is? Do you guys know the dark crystal? Because Kinnigan was saying that these he believes this is an alpha draconis everything that i've heard alpha draconis are huge and 
tend to be white, so that's the opposite. But you know, this is a guy that uh, you know his whole everything is is all about studying the reptilians, and uh, so that's what he thinks it is. And if we see the bad guys in the Dark Crystal movie, you know, let me bring them up. Because there is always a little truth hidden as we were talking about this. The Skekis, which are the bad guys in the Dark Crystal. This is kind of like what he's saying this being really looks like. So I'll leave it up to you guys. Check it out. I'll give you all the links. Run it a few times. See what you think. What's, what's your take, Cindy? Um, you know, when I first saw it, I, I thought it's an alligator. But then, like, when you look at it closer, it's almost like there's something sitting on its head or it has some kind of crown or I don't know. But the way that it walks, it walks kind of... Shuffles, it, it shuffles kind not, of. Not typical human. No, no, it doesn't seem like a typical human. So I think it would be hard to Photoshop the way it walks. That's a good point. That's a good point. So this is really curious. I just wanted to share this with you guys. Definitely uh, leave your comments. Let me know what you think. As always, thank you for your support on Patreon and Ko-Fi, and make sure to like, share, subscribe to both channels and. Uh, I want to thank you guys for keeping us afloat as every video gets demonetized because it makes all the difference in the world. As always, my friend, we'll, we'll keep searching for the truth together. God bless and namaste.